<laughs> well, let me do anything until I accepted that you were recording it. Yeah. <clears throat> that just wants to make sure that everybody knows before you get going. Yeah. Who all's here so far? All right. Mary and Tom. Howdy. And Miss Burks. I'm here this time. <laughs> Rocky tattletailed on me last time. You know, you could have just gone through it, see, and acted like I was there all along, Rocky, in the background. Oh. <laughs> You must have watched the video. <laughs> I did. I wasted a lot of time trying to edit it. Oh, really? Yeah. I finally managed to tackle it. I don't know what the problem was. Yeah, I'll watch it. What's your cat's name? This is Liza Jane. Liza Jane. <laughs> what a cutie. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> she tries to get in all videos, I think. <laughs> we have to lock ours up or they'll watch everybody on the screen and we can't see anybody. So <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> She's known to do that as well. Just get right in front of the camera. <laughs> I saw the moon uh, early this morning and boy was it uh, something to see so large and vibrant yeah it's a full moon right now yes I'm looking Late. forward to seeing it tonight yeah <laughs> we're probably not going to see anything because it's supposed to start raining here in about 10 minutes oh, no. oh, oh really yeah, I just got an alert on my phone that it's going to start raining. Oh, wow. Yeah, and they're having the big uh, parade downtown. Yeah, yeah the St. Patty's Day parade is tonight, and it's they're going to get rained on. <laughs> That's right. You're in Hot Springs, aren't you? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yes. I was just there this past weekend for the uh, high school basketball championship at the convention center. Cool. Yeah. yeah. Downtown was a madhouse today. I believe it. Yeah. We got off work at four o'clock and bugged out. <laughs> we, we got out of downtown. Yeah. Yeah, it looks like the rain's supposed to get here about 10 o'clock. That's in Heber Springs. Yep. Right now it's clear. Yeah, it was it was 76 degrees here in Hartley nice. County when we left work. Yeah. Is it raining? No, it's really dark. Oh, yeah, okay. Really dark. All right. <clears throat> I think I've got everything set up that I need. You were talking about some of the programs. The one that we use on our phone, I don't know if you guys can see this or not. It's called Starlink. I don't know, Starwalk. Starwalk. And it, Starlink and what? Starwalk. Starwalk 2. And when you move it around, it'll show you different. It's hard to see now, I know. But it shows you different constellations. And let's see if I can hold it. 
Does it orient to where you're pointing it in the stock in the sky? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So it's moving around, but I, yeah. I've, I've got it sitting on where the sun is setting right now. Uh -huh. I can see that or not. In yeah, I can. Yeah. So it shows where the constellation is. And the, uh, the neat thing I like about it is it draws out the constellation. So you can actually see what, you know, what it's talking about. Mm -hmm. Star walk. That's what it is. There's a, yeah, we use the free version, of course. There's another Star Walk, but we use Star Walk 2. <laughs> so you can, you have to wait for an ad every once in a while. Yeah, so, some of them, several of them do that. Uh, Sky Safari does that. Yeah. I always get confused when it's doing it, though, because I'm trying to look up stuff. And if I don't, you know, <laughs> usually. <laughs> We downloaded a new app on our phone too. Rather than buying a red flashlight or putting the red lens on our flashlight, we bought a thing called Night Vision, and it turns your phone into a red screen so you can. Oh, use really? Use ah. Yeah. That's an app. See how it, it makes my yeah. phone red. And you can adjust the brightness too in case it's too bright while you're out. Wow. That's neat. It is pretty cool. I swear there's like what? an app for everything now. I know. <laughs> yeah. What'd you say? Finding the, the International Space Station, too. What'd you say, dear? Oh, there's an app for everything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, they don't have one to brush my teeth yet. So, I'm <laughs> <laughs> but that was pretty clever to, uh, to think of uh, a red light app like that. That's interesting. Sure. Yeah. Now, I'll, I'll never, uh, I'll always, if I've got my phone with me, I'll always have a red light. Yeah. <laughs> Come Susan. Yeah, I cringe when uh, Jeff starts talking about putting red cellophane or painting painting a lens red now because there's so many different, so many good red lights now, and there mm -hmm. used to not not be. Now you can get a you can get red lights pretty off of eBay for a dollar or two, <laughs> a couple of dollars. <laughs> you know, I I've I've got. Uh, a light that uh, you know goes on your head mm -hmm. which is pretty convenient but and then i've got several handheld flashlights and i don't care what how sturdy they look or what you spend on them eventually all those handheld lights quit working <laughs> <laughs> or you have to shake them or something to make them work <laughs> yeah 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 and i never have figured out what that's about you know i why that happens you know i've, I've filed the contacts you know and sometimes that helps but not always i don't yeah. know why they're not more durable and i, I hate throwing using, things away i started using coast and uh and and if you're it goes out on coast you send it back to them with five dollars and they'll replace it oh, of course really? they cost a lot to start with but they work real good coast ready to pair go to the bluetooth settings in your mobile device and choose amazon tap dash one Six D. Somebody's pairing up, huh? <laughs> I I've looked up um, a lot of red lights on Amazon, and like Bruce said, everybody seems to say that they go bad after a while and they just stop working. Yeah, I don't know what that's about, but this little headband thing I've got's been real good in it, and it hasn't gone bad yet. But the problem is now I think Rocky's got the. Uh, I think it was Rocky. The problem with mine is, is, is it's got white and red and it's a little tricky to figure mm -hmm. out. I, mm -hmm. I never have really figured it out. I just keep punching it till it turns red, but, <laughs> but, uh, I don't know what the trick to it is. And the problem is, is if you turn it off, then you, you, you risk turning it back on you, you end up with what you can end up with a white light. All right. And, yeah. uh, I think Rocky found one that eliminates that problem. I think that's where he's gone to get it uh if i were buying one now that's what i would get the one rocky found i remember him saying something in a club meeting about that we'll see what he comes up with yeah i think he had a picture that he showed us of the time he bought and angie is muted she doesn't want to be with us and susan's <laughs> muted they, they don't want to be sociable <laughs> Angie How you heard doing? that. How you doing, Angie? Well, you were supposed to hear it. 
Well, uh, my husband is stationed in a different town, and he's uh, started uh, his vacation this week, so he's he's home. So I'm trying to get a visit in with him and try to get everything ready for this. Well, we have taken- a great time looking at constellations, though. We have to take care of our husbands now. Yeah, I know. Yeah, that's important. <laughs> so, so Bruce, on this one, you push the uh, push that one, and the red light comes on. And you push this one, and the white light comes on. So it's real distinct. Well, uh, I it's mean, you clear, gotta, huh? It's well, clear I mean, it's how too, it works. Yeah, Mine's it's not di- clear. It's, it's got a little rubber thing. thing over the buttons, and I, I don't, I don't know. But if you oh, hold well. it down for a long time or, or something, I don't, I don't know what no, it you is. Just, I mean, the red light's just on and off, and the yeah. white white light's got three different, three different um, levels. Levels, yeah. And then yeah. this one is a uh, is nice, and it's just you you, know, you got to do it twice yeah. to get the red light. Push yeah. Okay. Twice. See, that's the kind of thing I got some probably yeah. like I have. Yeah. But anyway, that's it's bad. Those are both coasts, and those I've had those. I've had one of these for about three years now. It's been good. Okay, I haven't been able to to shame Susan into getting unmuted one in us. <laughs> she might be finishing dinner. Yeah. <laughs> I thought that. Yeah. <laughs> now another thing in the winter, uh, I like to have gloves. And I've got a pair of gloves that are, uh, you know, the problem with gloves then is you can't feel and you don't have any dexterity. But these gloves have uh, have the fingers cut out at the, at the ends, you know, so they cover your hand. And then they've got a mitt that folds out of the way. So you do this with your fingers when you need to. And then you just pull that mitt end over your fingers uh, and it acts like a nice, good glove. Cool. I think those are called convertible. Oh, the convertible gloves. I've had those before when I lived in yeah. Chicago. Yeah. 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 Well, they're, they're handy dandy. I, people they are. don't, people don't appreciate how cold it is at night. I mean, it is just not the same <laughs> at the same temperature. It's colder at night. Cause that sun's not, you know, not there to warm you up that radiating heat. Even with even when the air temperature is the same, it's colder at night. It's like 10, 15 degrees feels like. So we got we got Susan on here twice. <laughs> Two Susans. Hey, yeah, I'm special. <laughs> I think we got one Susan, but she's on here twice. That's what I think. Yeah. Am, am I right? Uh, no, I, I don't, yeah. No, I don't think so. I think don't my think Susan- so. I think well, I've got another good. Susan over here that's muted. Both, neither one of you have got your video on. <laughs> Must have your hair up or something. <laughs> Wait a minute, do I press start video? Huh? Do yeah, yeah. Video? There I you go. Dark, aren't I? <laughs> yeah, I'm still closed off. <laughs> yeah, I could, I could detect your chuckle. Your <laughs> so you know it's me <laughs> uh-huh you got a chuckle that goes with that smile you wear <laughs> oh that's, i didn't know that i guess that's good isn't it <laughs> <laughs> well it's not bad thanks <laughs> all right so we're sneaking up on a couple more minutes we've talked about gloves and we've talked about flashlights now somebody said they've been out observing who's been out observing We haven't talked about that. Angie, what did you do? Well, I have done the whole kit and caboodle. Well, not the whole kit and caboodle, but I found a little notebook and I was looking at the challenges and I was writing down what I did and what I saw. And I had never really observed the winter hexagon and I found all of that. And so now when I go outside, I just instantly see it. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so that's great um i did want to share this book um i got this book oh let me see there we go 
uh, at the library. So I just okay. loaned it from the library, but it's been great. Um, I've been looking at constellations ever since I was a kid, but uh, so, you know, the North Star and the Big and Little Dipper and all that and Orion and Orion's Belt, you know, all those were, were easy, but this one has uh, pictures of each one and then a description on how to find it. And, um, you know, I've been using these also that, that were, that we, that we printed out, but this was a, this was a very, very helpful book. Okay. So I got That's that from, I just got from the library. Angie, what's the title of that? Total Astronomy for Kids. Astronomy, Astronomy for, for Kids. Really? By Bruce. Yeah. By Bruce Betts. Uh-oh. I got my blur on. Here we go. Uh, B-E-S. <laughs> yeah. So I, the, I've really enjoyed looking at this. Uh, Cassiopeia is one I was always able to find, but like the Winter Hexagon, I've never really done that one. The other book I checked out that also helped me a little bit was uh, the National Audubon Society Field Guide for uh, the Night Sky. And That's so a good it's one. got, yeah, it's got, you know, colored pictures in it and it's kind of all categorized out. So I had a couple of other ones checked out, but they, they weren't. It's got some pretty good charts in it too, <clears throat> as I recall. Yeah, it does. So um, I have these until March uh, 20, 31st, I think, 28th, something like that. So anyway, I, um yeah but i uh i'm trying to learn the names of the stars and so i guess a lot of times when i would look outside i thought that sirius was venus because it was bright mm -hmm. and so i was able to correct that misunderstanding and so yeah i go out and and I and I say the names out loud. I've got a chaise lounge outside. <laughs> right. I tell you what, you better be glad this is online because uh, Rocky be trying to hug your neck. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say, uh, Venus. Uh, Venus is actually most of the time a lot brighter than Sirius. Um, well, and it, I and, um, and, it's, and it never gets close to it. It, it may should be. I, a, should I be able to see Venus right now? I don't think so. I think it's uh, okay. If it is, if you can, it's in the morning. I'll look and see okay. here. So, okay. So, uh, okay. So, Mary, you said you were out. Yeah, we were last night. We we said we we're going to go out because we we haven't had very clear skies, but we saw. Uh, we tried to do some of the ones on the checklist from the page, but uh, we the big one that was up in our sky, we have a lot of trees around us. So our viewing is kind of limited. So we kind of look back to the Southwest uh, and it was about, what about 10 till 10. And uh, Orion was up in our sky. And uh, so we got the binoculars and went out there and saw uh, the nebula that are along his belt in the sword blade. We could uh -huh. M42. Yeah. And uh, and then all the stars that went with him, uh, Rigel and uh, Beetlejuice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, Bellatrix. And um, and we saw Sirius and the little dog, too. And was, the, the moon was in Leo, so it was kind of hard to see anything yeah. in Leo. But yeah, we saw Venus this morning as we were backing out to go to work. Yeah, Venus is a, and and with binoculars you might be able to see Mars and Saturn because they're all together right there. And this is um, this is about six thirty. Yep. Tomorrow morning. In the morning. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you can see the sun just getting ready to peak up. Okay. Looks like. Let's see what they do in the next week. There comes the moon by. So you can see uh, Venus, uh, yeah. Venus is oh, wow. going to stay in the same place and Saturn and Mars come together. So that's on um, on the 28th. They'll be all together. Look at that's Jupiter. pretty low in the sky. And see here, Jupiter's coming up too. Yeah. Just. So all the planets are in the are in the morning sky right now. Is that Mercury okay. below Saturn? Um, no. 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 I, I don't know where Mercury is. It's... It would show up if it was up. 
it may be hiding on the back side of the sun. Most time it's not very close to a, it's not very. Uh, Wait, time out. Evident <laughs> where it is. <laughs> oh, I'm following Venus, aren't I? All right. Well, I want to hear about everybody else and then we need to get started. So who else has gotten out? <clears throat> well, I get out every night with the dog, but um, it has been, you know, cloudy a lot. But right. what I discovered, you know, when I've, I've really gotten into all this, but it mostly it's just my enjoying the stars and the moon and, and knowing that it's waxing or waning, nothing, you know, big time or like this and um so when i went out and tried to do that there my my street has more street lights on it than any other street in the city i promise you it does of course and there's like one here and one here and then there are trees across the street everywhere and my backyard is all trees so i just have this little southwest view out of here but i've got to put my hands up like this to keep those huge street lights out so i can't see anything and i thought I think I'm going to have to ask for suggestions of public places that I could run over to or something. Yeah. Uh, rural churchyards are a good, great place, to tell you the truth. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, maybe just churchyards, period. I live near Markham in Mississippi. Maybe there's several churches on Mississippi. Maybe I could just run up to one of those. Yeah, if, you can, uh, if you can get in the, you know where where you can just block lights i block i block lights with my truck a lot of times you know just park my truck where i can block a light <laughs> yeah, if you live in little rock i tell you it's probably not it's not very far from you at all and it's a great place to go it, and that's the soccer fields uh the soccer the city soccer fields uh uh out near Pinnacle on uh, Highway 300. Oh no, that's it's that's probably way, maybe 15 that's minutes. Way too far. No, I'm no, I don't drive at night. It, it's oh. little trails that I I know because I uh -huh. don't feel at night, and so I can go. Like I, I drove to the Symphony the other night. Yeah, I was really proud of myself. Yeah. <laughs> I just well, do you know? Do you know, field, do you know where the soccer field? Do you know where the soccer fields are? No, I don't. Huh? What's the closest one to like uh, Dillard's? Let's say. Uh, uh, the soccer fields are out near Pinnacle Mountain. Oh, you go uh, out Highway 10 and then you uh, yeah. go up 300, just a couple of miles, and they're on the yeah. left. No, I can't. East of Lake Maumelle. Yeah, I can't see well enough. Yeah, do you don't want to do that. Well, I can't do that. Yeah, I can't do that. <laughs> Anybody else to get out and observe before we get going? Want to talk about it? Got a confession to make or anything? All right. <laughs> We're well, going a big day. I've already oh, made my confession. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's get started. I'm going to share screen. Well, one of these days I'm going to get good at this. All right. <laughs> Let me move this down. Move it out of the way. And view. View, 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 view. At the very top. Oh, uh, over here on the right where it says slideshow. Oh, you found another place. Yeah. Oops. I didn't start. I don't, I'm not where I need to be. Let me back up. Okay. I don't know why Rocky stuck this in, slide in here in my in my half. What did you have in mind, Rocky, with this uh, slide? Anything? I didn't mean. I didn't mean, you didn't mean to, to do it. Okay. Well, we've talked about Stellarium and showed it to you, so I don't need to. Whatever the purpose of that was. So we're going to take a minute and talk about light pollution. I mean, after all, this is the Arkansas Natural Sky Association and. We're an environmental group concerned with light pollution. So you got to expect that you're going to get five or six minutes worth of, of uh, lecture on light pollution at some point in here. And so that's where we are right now. This slide shows the progression with which uh, uh, light pollution has occurred starting in the uh, late 50s and then finally projected into the future because it continues to grow. 
Uh, you can see here, here is uh, Little Rock right there. If you can see my cursor, that's Memphis. And uh, there's the Washita Forest and the Ozark Forest. You can see them, but they're slowly disappearing. And there's no place in the state with a purely naturally dark sky anymore, even yet. Uh, and of course, this is wasted energy. It's a huge amount of wasted energy. I, I keep saying we'll know we're starting to get serious about uh, uh, global warming and carbon when we, uh, when we start learning how to light responsibly and turn off the lights we don't need. Uh, and uh, uh, because it's about 6% of our electricity is used to light the outdoors these days. Uh, <clears throat> a 100 watt light bulb left on all night for a year generates almost a half a ton of carbon dioxide. And a great deal of the light that is used out, it's not only was it not necessary to start with, but it's improperly aimed or improperly shielded. And it ends up going where it, you, 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 you was never wanted in the first place, including into the sky where it creates a sky glow and what we commonly think of as light pollution. And so there's a huge amount of money wasted on this as well. Uh, and that just, this just summarizes that. Uh, but there's a, a lot more to light pollution than wasted money and, and uh, carbon and, uh, and the loss of the stars because it turns out, perhaps we shouldn't be surprised if you think about it, that the diurnal cycle, which is the cycle of, of, of day and night, uh, is a, a, a central aspect of life on Earth and the environment on Earth. Everything that lives on the surface of the planet has evolved under this cycle of light and dark, night and day, light and dark. Uh, and uh, the biology, uh, including us human, our biology is keyed into that cycle on a physiological level. It's not just a behavioral thing it's it's physiological down to the hormone level uh and uh and this is true of humans it's true of uh all kinds of other animals it impacts uh, breeding and feeding and migration uh in humans uh uh, uh exposure to artificial light at night suppresses the melatonin uh the hormone the hormonal cycle of melatonin melatonin when the sun goes down in a natural setting we have receptors in our eyes that are not for seeing. They're there just to detect the presence of daylight and dark. And uh, when the sun goes down, it gets, uh, uh, in a natural setting, it gets dark. And uh, those receptors kick off the melatonin process. And if you're exposed to artificial light, particularly in the blue spectrum, it retards or delays that process. Uh, and uh, the American Medical Association tells us that it's a poses an artificial exposure to artificial light at night, poses an re increased risk of breast and prostate cancer, uh, diabetes, depression, and obesity, all of which are epidemic in modern life. There was a study out just last week, I noticed, where they were trying to determine just how sensitive this process is. And they had people sleep in a room with a TV that was left on, uh, but without any sound. Uh, and, uh, it turns out even that little light, even with your eyes closed is enough to impact your, uh, your, uh, your system, uh, uh, it, it, with it showing an increase of blood pressure and an impact on your ability to process insulin, which I guess is why the diabetes is a risk. But anyway, I spent more time on that. I wanted to, but, um, uh, it's a significant factor. The American Medical Association has issued public, two public health statements on uh, the risk of exposure to light at night. Uh, so the good news about light pollution is it, it would be a fairly easy thing to address if we, if we just uh, 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 showed a little uh, uh, concern and, and had a little knowledge about it. And the first place you start is by properly shielding lights. Um, and, uh, so that the light is shines on what you want to see rather than shines in your eye or goes on the neighbor's bedroom or up into the sky. And this just illustrates how improperly shielded lighting. It looks a lot of people think in illumination engineering society handbook on outdoor lighting notes that a lot of people think brighter is better, but the actual reality is. Uh, it's easy to demonstrate that improperly shielded and overly bright lighting detracts from your visibility. 
if you've ever sat around a campfire and tried to see in the woods over it, uh, you get the sense of what we're talking about. There's a reason that all of the lamps and fixtures in your house have shades on them. Uh, and this illustrates what happens, how it reduces your visibility. Glare can reduce your visibility, improperly shielded uh, fixtures. Uh, <clears throat> you know, I, I, when I give a talk on this, it takes me about 30, 35 minutes to go through all this. So you get a very condensed uh, uh, rendition, but I just throw this in as an, because it exemplifies all the things that can be wrong with outdoor lighting. I mean, this, this fixture has it all. Um, first of all, it's way too bright. And while this is a camera and not an eye, the, the, uh, the function is the same. When you have a really bright uh, light like this in front of the camera or in front of the eye, your eye and the camera adapt to that bright light and then everything else becomes a dark drum. So you can't see anything past the, uh, the corner of that house. Anything beyond exactly where that light is falling is completely dark. And if your whole point here is just to illuminate the property so it can be observed, you've defeated it, your purpose on one half of the property. Uh, it's, uh, got, it's a white light. It's got too much blue in it, which is biologically active uh, and impacts human health and wildlife. In fact, if you look here, that looks like snow. I hope you can see that. That's not snow. Those are insects. Mm -hmm. They're captured, effectively captured by that light, flying themselves to death. The ground was littered with uh, dead insects that yeah. had flown. But Germany has passed a lighting regula national lighting regulations, specifically out of concern that the biomass is uh, collapsing uh, due in part to, uh, to this kind of feature with lights. The next problem with it is, is it's aimed horizontally instead of down. Uh, and so you can see about half the lights going up in the sky. A great deal of the light is going off the property over here, which fortunately nobody lives over there. Only a little bit of the light is actually lighting where you want it to be illuminated. Uh, and the last thing that's wrong with it is dusted on lighting, which is almost never a good idea. You want, uh, you want lighting that's either uh, uh, run by a switch, so you turn it on when you need it and off when you don't need it, or a motion sensor, which uh, it, for security lighting is, is a good fi a fixture, or for your driveway, you want to drive up your drive and have the light come on, motion sensor, or occupancy. Uh, you've probably, many people have used to seeing occupancy switches in houses now, but those are now available in parking lots. So the parking lot lights are not on unless somebody drives into the parking lot. Uh, the technology is there to, uh, to address this problem. We just have to con be concerned with it and address it. Uh, you know, years ago, I barely remember this little short course. Uh, I studied interior design, but we had a little short course and I had to buy a big book, <laughs> an expensive book for this little short course on lighting. But I remember they said something about metal halide lighting, which is the salmon color. Uh huh. Bulbs being the best. And I think that's what they have on here on my street. They yeah, uh, it's uh, high pressure sodium. High pressure sodium is a salmon color light. Yeah. And, and there was a time when it was the most efficient uh, a technology. It's not anymore. LED is far more efficient. And we can get you into get that bright white light instead of the softer light. Yeah, but you can get LED in a warmer color. Oh, you can? Uh, yes. Uh, and so you can get the efficiency of the LED and then a warm color. Uh, the IDA recommends 3,000 degrees Kelvin are, uh, are cooler. It's a warmer color, but it's a cooler temperature. It's, that's, it's ups that seems upside down, but um, I actually think uh, 2700 is, is a sweet spot. You still, it's still a, a white light, but it's a warm white light. Uh, and, um, and, and that makes it real efficient for the eye uh, as well as technologically efficient, but it keeps the blue content uh, reasonably down. Uh, you can go on our website and uh, IDA has a, uh, a little uh, uh, 
feature on their website. There's a link on ours uh, um, and where you can go in and, and inventory your own lighting. And uh, you go through a little checklist and verify that you're lighting responsibly. Uh, and then you can download a certificate if you want and, and hang it on your, on your wall. But um, uh, basically it boils down to um, four basic principles uh, that are really easy to understand. Uh, the first one is, uh, is only light when you have an actual purpose for it. Define why you're doing it. Why am I doing it? And, uh, and then only use it if you have uh, an actual rational purpose to use it. The second thing is, if I can get it to go, is aim it and shield it so that it lands only where you need it. So don't use it if you, unless you need it. And then if you need it, only put it where it needs to be. Uh, the last is, I mean, the third is active controls, which I've already mentioned. Switches, motion sensors, occupancy switches, so that it gets used when it's needed. Mm -hmm. So only use it, uh, only use light that you do need, only put it where you need it, and only have it on when you need it. And the fourth one is uh, make sure that it's not overly, uh, that it's not too bright. That it's just, you want you want it uh, enough light to last to to illuminate the task you're doing and no more to help preserve your visibility in the broader scheme of things. Uh, and then the final one is the color. And you can see here where it talks, I need to get rid of this though, where it talks about the 3000 degrees Kelvin uh, and they recommend 2700 Kelvin or less in a home. Well, so I'm, they agree with me or I agree with them. It's particularly nice inside that way. A 2700 is a nice warm color. You don't want uh, you don't want a, a cold blue light in your house. And you don't need it outside. So that's how that works. Now, what's going on? All right. Um, just a little note, and I got word today. By the way, we've been working with the little town of Gilbert. It's the smallest town in the in the uh, state, incorporated uh, city in the state. And it's uh, borders the Buffalo National River, which is our first international dark sky park. Uh, and we've been trying to get them uh, appropriate street lighting to replace their uh, existing fixtures for like uh, two and a half years now. And uh, it's been a struggle. Uh, uh, Entergy is not really interested in seeing this happen. Uh, that's their power company. But uh, we finally uh, uh, got word today that, that uh, the energy has just satisfied itself that the lights we picked out uh, uh, pass muster for their system. Uh, and hopefully in the coming months, we will uh, get those installed and have our dark sky, our first dark sky festival in the state in October 21 and 22 in Gilbert. Uh, next thing I want to show you is how you can become a citizen scientist and uh, monitor your, the light pollution around your home uh, and report it as a citizen scientist and contribute to, uh, to the, data, the, 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 the database uh, that's, uh, that's being uh, developed uh, or being maintained, I should say, uh, monitoring the progression of light pollution. Um, and, um, and it's called a globe at night, and you can Google it and it'll pop right up. Uh, and I'm going to, instead of going through these slides, I'm going to, um, switch to that website and just show you how it works. Cause it's sort of, it's, it's really fun. I mean, in addition to making a contribution to the deal, it's just a fun little website. Uh, and the way it works is, uh, they pick out the uh, the time of the month, you know, and what it is, is the time when the moon's not out in the evening. They pick out the time of the month and they pick out the const a constellation that you can use to judge the degree of light pollution in your home or your observing place. Uh, and so what you do is this is 2022 and we're in the northern 
constellations because we're in the nor nor northern hemisphere. So we're coming up here on March 23 through April 1. It's going to be the next time <clears throat> when you could go out and use this system to uh, to uh, uh, measure the level of light pollution at your house and report it. And what you're going to use here is the Leo constellation Leo. Now, if you go on through the years, you see they've got different constellations. But what it is is the constellation that's that's high in the sky near the zenith uh, during the period of time that's uh, that you're dealing with here. And so it tells you, can you find Leo? Uh, and it gives you a little chart. You can put in how where you are. We're about between 30 and 40 north. So I just put 30 north in. And this will give you the, the layout of the sky and help you find it. And then what you do is you go in here and here are these charts and you find the chart that best represents your sky. And it's a, is it a magnitude three or a four or five, a six or seven or so forth or a one? You, you compare this to the sky uh, that you've got uh, and pick it out and then you uh, report it or what your conclusions are. Now, one more thing before I go show you how that works is it also has the mythology, which is fun. So, while you're learning that constellation, you can also right here on this website get a, a read down, a readout on the on the uh, on the uh, uh, folklore. Uh, now hey, I'm a Leo, and I appreciate y'all looking me up and <laughs> checking me out at night. <laughs> uh huh. Right. Uh, and here are the charts, and I think you can print these things out so that you can carry them out. I know you can. Uh, you can also download a, a, uh, an app to do this with, uh, and then you can report your data. Uh, well, it, this is the data. Let's just go ahead and look at your, if you report your data, it'll show up on this map. See all these all these measurements. I got a lot more around Russellville this year. Oh, there's a bunch. Sometimes it's a little slow coming in. Somebody around Russellville is really diligent uh, with this, but you can come in here and click on it. You know, and it's, it's if it's yours, it's particularly fun to do. Uh, see your measurements and when it was taken, your comments and so forth. Um, so finally, how to report this data. Uh, yeah. How do you report the data? It's been a while since I looked at this. Uh, report, here we go. Allow. So uh, you go in here and you find your position on this map and it'll enter the coordinates for you. And, uh, and then you just pick out your magnitude that you saw and click on it. You make any comments you want to about sky conditions and so forth, and then hit enter. It's that simple and you're in. So now I'm gonna go back to the slideshow, which I probably really don't need to do because I'm gonna turn this over to Rocky. No, no, I've got, I do have, I do have, let me get out of that. Where's my slideshow? How do I get back to my slideshow? There we go. All right. Now I got to go back in the view. We mentioned, I don't know why Rocky left this for me to do. That's M42, by the way. Uh, uh, of course, you don't see that kind of color with it with the eyeball. But uh, we mentioned this, I think, before when we were talking about charts and the M objects, the Messier objects. This is uh, little thumbnails of all those objects. And you can see that some of them are like this, like this uh, exploded star here. Uh, some are globular clusters like this. 
Some are emission nebulae, so-called emission nebulas like M42, which is down here. But there are a number of these stellar nursery areas uh, uh, where you have hydrogen um, gas that's uh, illuminated. You have up planetary nebulas here, where another one where a star is blown up. This is a nebula where a star is blown up. You've got open clusters like uh, the Pleiades here. Uh, and you've got uh, galaxies, uh, uh, the Sombrero galaxy here. Uh, it's full of interesting objects, about, about 110 of them, I think, and about, almost half of them are probably approachable uh, with binoculars. And this is just uh, uh, Charles, Mr. Messier. And as you recall, I told you he was a common hunter and he logged these. To, so that he would know if, when he ran across them again that they weren't comets. Uh, just so he could quit. It was a, a removal of a nuisance factor for him to, to catalog these uh, vague, uh, fuzzy, uh, in his scope, just little fuzzballs that might be comets, except they weren't. And, and he knew that because they wouldn't move. And then this is some of them that we picked out, sort of what you might see in a pair of binoculars. Uh, uh, it, under a fairly dark sky. Uh, that's maybe too much right here. That'd be an awfully large pair of binoculars for M42. But the rest of these, pretty much like what you might see. Here's a, 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 a planetary nebula, an exploded star over here, the so-called dumbbell. And this is uh, Andromeda Galaxy. It's our nearest major galactic neighbor, neighbor about 2 million light years away and subtends about six lunar diameters in the sky, if you could see it all. You can't, when you look at it from binoculars or a telescope, what you see is this inner core here, but if you could see it all, it takes six moons uh, across. And you think about that being 2 million light years away and being that big in the sky. All right, Rocky, your turn. Okay, um, you wanna stop it and let me- uh, Oh let yeah. Me Okay, um, so uh, uh, I had some more um, research uh, or uh, things helps. Now, one of them that I use a lot is YouTube videos. Uh, so you can find YouTube videos on about everything. Um, on uh, learning the constellations, uh, on uh, photography of the sky, on learning how to use Stellarium. Uh, so, don't forget about the YouTube videos. I, I, I enjoy those. And there's all, and, and then once, and a lot of, there's several of them where they give uh, what's up, at, what you need to look for in the next month, conjunctions and things like that, that you might not think to look for. And also the constellations that are up. Okay. And, uh, Here's, here's some apps, and we've already been talking about apps, but one of them that I'd highly recommend is to put Stellarium on your computer and uh, uh, play with it. It's just like uh, learning it's a lot of fun. And there there's some YouTube good YouTube videos on learning how to use Stellar Stellarium. And it's not that hard once you get, once you get some of the basics down. Uh, and I've talked about a little bit about Sky Safari, Lunar HD, Lunar phase calendar, that's kind of handy. Heavens above, space weather tells you um, what kind of sunspots you've got right now and if there's going to be an aurora, which we don't have any of. And we've talked about atmospheric. I've got those listed on your handout. And I put a handout in the, um, uh, in the chat box. And, uh, you know, if you want to take it farther, uh, and you maybe join uh, join our club, or you can join the Astro League uh, as a member at large. Uh, but they've got some really really good programs uh, for all levels of astronomy. They've got like seventy of them now. But the Messier objects, um, you can do uh, either with binoculars. It's like fifty objects with uh, with telescopes. It's all one hundred and ten, um, and. Uh, Another one is lunar, which is one of the easiest ones, I think. 
and it's um, and you can do it with binoculars, strictly binoculars, or both binoculars and telescope. Um, mess, mess here, I talked about it. Um, universe sampler is another one. Constellation hunter, learning the constellations. So they give you some good things, and you can do those even if you don't earn the award. It gives you a list of things to do. Okay, I was gonna. Okay, I've I've gone over the. Um, I think a good way to learn the sky is to is to learn the winter hexagon to start with, and then learn uh, the spring diamond. And um, once you learn those basic things, and spring diamond is easy to find because because uh, you start with the Big Dipper, remember, and you make an arc to arc cirrus, and um, uh, and you can watch if if you get out every a week every week or so and just look up in the sky and find these and re-familiarize yourself with them, you get an idea of the movements of the sky and what's up when. I noticed they've changed our timing now. I think they've uh, done away with standard time. And from now on, we're going to be strictly on daylight savings time. Did y'all hear that? Yeah. I yeah. thought they were going to do it the other way. <laughs> they, they haven't done that yet. It's, oh, they haven't? Good. No, the Senate passed it. The House has got it. It, it, it It's not law yet. Oh, good. Looks like it's likely to be. Yeah. I don't they, think they ought to. I mean, I was... I, I, I was out early this morning about 7.30 and there were kids, almost, it was almost dark at 7.30. And this yeah. is, and- I made, and a post, know, I made a post on Facebook about it. I didn't think anybody would respond. At last I checked, there were 42 responses and almost everybody agrees we should just do away with DST rather than making it permanent. But at any yeah. rate. Anyway, uh, and the next one is the summertime and summertime is just, just great. The the summer triangle is really easy to pick out, and and very interesting constellations. The Milky Way runs right through it, and so after you learn the um, the winter hexagon and the and you got about a month left because it's going to start going down pretty fast now. Uh, then the winter, then the spring diamond, and then learn the uh, 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 summer triangle, which is which was one of the fir the first big one that I learned and it just makes it easy to uh, easy to start locating constellations once you know the summer triangle and it's got three bright stars I'm not going to go through it like I have the other ones um, I, I've got a confession to make in here real quick Rocky okay I, at years and years and years of observing and it always seemed like to me the spring sky disappeared in a big hurry and that the summer sky lingered forever into the fall and I never thought about why until Rocky pointed it out to me what was going on. And this goes back to what we talked about on the first night. And that is uh, the seasons, the impact of the seasons and how as you're moving into summer from spring, uh, the sun is setting later and later. And so you're out later and later, even as the sky is going further west each day. And uh, so th th those two things build on themselves and it disappears in a hurry. Contrary wise, the the day is uh, getting, uh, the night is coming uh, earlier in the fall. And so even though the sky's moving west, same speed it does any other time, uh, you're going out earlier and earlier. So you're catching it earlier. So it just lingers. It's like, it's never gonna go away. <laughs> it, it's almost like it stands still all through the fall. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You go out, if you go out at dark every night, it's about the same place. It doesn't move that much because every night it's getting dark four minutes earlier and it's moving about four minutes. So anyway, um, the next one is a, is a really beautiful part of the sky. That's the southern, south of the uh, summer triangle is the uh, summer, I call it the summer ecliptic because it's got uh, three ecliptical uh, constellations in it, Sagittarius, Scorpius, and Ophiuchus, which uh, is not officially an ecliptic constellation, but I think it's got about uh, where the sun is in, in Scorpius about 10 days, it's in Ophiuchus about 20 something days. So uh, Ophiuchus is that, it's along the ecliptic. So planets will stay in Ophiuchus longer than they will Scorpius. Um, but anyway, uh, uh, the Milky Way runs right down between uh, Sagittarius and Scorpius. You've got, uh, all, see all these uh, 
Messier objects, they're, they're all just about reachable with binoculars, most of them are. They're bright. Uh, you're looking toward the uh, center of the Milky Way when you're looking in, in this area right in here, if you can see my thing. Um, so it's a, it's a uh, once you learn the summer triangle, that helps you guide you to the, the southern stars and and uh, Scorpius is just uh, very easy to pick out because most of these are bright enough stars to see, uh, even if you've got mildly light, light, light polluted skies. And Sagittarius has got mostly bright stars. And Sagittarius, what does it look like? Teapot. And Teapot. guys, I want to call your attention this summer. Be sure and go out and see it. And not only does it look like a teapot, but the Milky Way is streaming out right out of the spout. So it looks like steam. And you point that out to people and they get a big tickle. It, it's a really tickles them. Yeah. But it's a lot of spectacular binocular objects in this area too. And then in the fall, we got the uh, fall square. So uh, we've got a, a, a ge geometric shape each season. And the neat thing about the fall is uh, is they're all related in mythology, most of them. Uh, if you remember the Clash of the Titans or the story uh, with Medusa and Perseus and Pegasus, Cassiopeia, Cepheus, um, and then Cetus the sea monster. Uh, so, so they're all in this, and, and also, yeah, they're all in this, in, the, in this part of the sky, in the fall sky together. And you've got the, I don't have the Milky Way in my picture, but you've got the, uh, not the Milky Way, the ecliptic. But in the ecliptic, you've got um, uh, Pisces, Aries, and Aries. And, and then you go on over to uh, the winter stars with, uh, with Taurus the bull. It's the next one. And I want to talk about the moon a little bit more. Um, I've got a few more things to say about it. We somebody asked had asked about uh, um, phase the phases and uh, you got to since since we talked about it maybe you got to go out and see some of the phases. Of course, we had a lot of cloudy weather, um, but basically the uh, when the moon's new, it's the sun it's between us and the sun, and when the moon is full like it is tonight it's on the opposite side of the sun. So every time it's full, it's gonna rise about dark, about right at, right at dusk or dark, dark. And uh, so that's when the moon rises when it's full, it's opposite the sun. And I wanna talk about eclipses because they're, they're, we've got several really good ones coming up. Um, of course, uh, we've got the solar eclipse in, uh, that'll come through most of Arkansas on 8th of April, 2024. And that's when the uh, moon is between the sun and the earth. But um, it's for us, it's, it's like, I don't know what it is in Little Rock. Do you, Bruce? It's like three and a half minutes or something in Little Rock. Something like, like that. It's over four minutes and, and a lot. And if you get on over a little west of that in Arkansas, uh, and to give you a comparison, the the eclipse of 2017, the max was was like two and a half minutes or two, two minutes, 40 seconds, something like that, if you were in the center of the eclipse. So uh, this is really going to be a good, good, that's really going to be a good solar eclipse. So make your plans to rent out your house now. <laughs> um. And we've got lunar eclipse coming. Oh, I've got this wrong. It's coming up on May the 16th. I've got it on the next slide. But the, um, the moon is, uh, uh, the earth comes between the sun and the moon. Uh, so it's a full moon like it is tonight, but, but we're not lined up perfectly tonight. But two months from tonight, when the moon is full, uh, two, uh, it, will, it will. And that is on... Uh, Oh, Rocky, was that your coloring job? Did you draw that? No, I don't know where we got that. I got it somewhere. Um, were you impressed with it? If you uh -huh, were, I was. It was fine. 
Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, it wasn't mine. Okay. Uh, Total Lunar Eclipse, May 16th to 17th, 2022. Um, and and this is for Batesville. This, these are the times for Batesville. So it par partially eclipse starts. So you'll start seeing a chunk out of the moon about 930. Total eclipse about 1030. A maximum eclipse about 1111. And the total eclipse ends about 1153. So it's an evening event. I mean, a lot of... Um, uh, eclipses are not even visible here and if they are they might be in the early morning this one's in the evening and it's a to it's a nice uh long total eclipse so get out and see it now what it, what you'll see is the the moon will might be a you know probably turn blood red and that's because of the diffraction of the light around through the atmosphere and stuff uh but it's it's worth getting out to see you don't get to see them very often and I also wanted to mention about the, the moon is interesting. Um, it takes, you got two different periods for the moon. It takes 27.32 days for the moon to come back, come around and come to the same point in the stars. Um, but to, but the whole time that's, that it's going around, the earth's moving. So, um, so to go from new moon to new moon or full moon to full moon, is 29.53 days. So it's a, that's a little bit longer. Um, and that's a little bit complicated, but anyway, you know that there's two different periods now. And, and if you wanna research it and try to understand it better, you can. Um, and the moon moves about 13 degrees per day or rises about four, 45 minutes later each day. So if you see the moon rising tonight at, at seven o'clock tomorrow night, you can estimate it's gonna rise about 7.45. So that's just kind of a good rule of thumb. Uh, sometimes it's, it's quicker than that. Sometimes it's lighter, depending on where it is in the ecliptic. And I had a little session on to teach you a little bit about binoculars. And uh, of course, this, this course, we, we hadn't talked about telescopes very much. And the reason for that is the best way to start is with binoculars, learning the sky and um, uh, finding, getting to find deep, sea, deep sky objects and seeing them. And, uh, um, basically going from naked eye to binoculars is about like going from binoculars to telescope. So, uh, you can, uh, uh, make a enjoyable step there by going th using binoculars. There's two main types of binoculars, portal prism and roof prism. Um, portal pr prism are, are best for astronomy for a few reasons, but the roof prisms are also really good. And, there's a lot, uh, there's some library telescope programs that uh, go in for both bird watching and astronomy. And they use the roof prism because those are actually better for bird watching, uh, lighter weight, but they cost, they cost more. Um, so, and how binoculars work, you've got the size of the objective, which is your light gathering and that's 50 millimeters on this pair of seven by fifties and seven power, which is how much it magnifies. Uh, so a seven by 50, and that's, that will be the value of the eyepiece. That, that's the power that's, that, that you're given by the eyepiece. The eyepiece determines the, the power as well as the focal length of this. But anyway, um, you don't need, that doesn't count in this, only in telescopes. But uh, another measure, and you can see it here, is, uh, is how wide a field of view that, that you have. And that's something that's very desirable for astronomy or just about anything, is to have a nice field of view. And your cheaper binoculars a lot of times won't have a nice wide field of view. <clears throat> um, so roof prism binoculars are more compact, but the portal prism delight design lets, a little, lets more light through and they're less expensive. Uh, like a good pair of, uh, and I've got, got them, I think I put it out the first week in case y'all wanted to buy some binoculars, but I, I've got a list and I've got a, um, a good pair of roof prism eight by 42s and they are 139 and a equivalent pair of roof of portal prism and they're about $80. So there, there's a pretty good price difference there. Um, 
the uh, roof prism are lighter white. Uh, the roof prism hold their collimation a little bit better. If you drop them or something, they're not as likely to, to get messed up. Um, another uh, thing is the eye relief. And that is uh, how close you have, to, how close your eye needs to be to the binoculars. Um, and you want, you want about si at least 16 or 17 millimeters. Uh, eye, eyeglass wearers especially have a problem with uh, if you've got a short eye relief. Okay, so good astronomy binoculars would be seven by 35, eight by 42, seven by 50, 10 by 50. They don't go bigger than that because if you get more than 10 power, you, you'll need a tripod. Avoid cheap binoculars that have usually have a narrow field of view and they're usually not sealed like, and uh, waterproofed or, or uh, multi-coated like the good binoculars. Um, the wider field of view is better. Avoid binoculars that are um, variable, you know, like go from seven power to 14 power or something like that, or ones that you don't have to focus because they're just not as good at binoculars. They're usually uh, pretty cheap binoculars. And you want multi-coated lenses. They give you, they let more light through and um, resist uh, dampness and water and finger fingers and stuff like that better. And uh, waterproofing. A lot of them now are filled with hydrogen, filled with uh, an inert gas like nitrogen or something to make sure no air seeps into them and they're sealed. So uh, here's just a list of, um, and I, I put those out on the, uh, this same list on the uh, first handout you got. So anyway, I think that's all I had. So I think Bruce and I are ready to answer questions now or do whatever. <laughs> are you planning on doing a little three time course on telescopes? Uh, no, but, <laughs> but um, I'd re recommend YouTube again, <laughs> but what do you want well, to know? I've always wanted a telescope, but I never bought one because I didn't really feel like I knew enough to really have a telescope, but I've well, always wanted a telescope. Ed do you, Ting, do you uh, live where the library has a telescope? Yeah, you can borrow one. I live in Van Buren, Arkansas, Fort Smith. We just put five the telescopes in there. Field. We just you we just located what? five telescopes there in the Van the Buren Bay in the uh, that library that, that system. library system. Okay, so you, in the Crawford County Library System. Yep. I guess it's Crawford County, yeah. Well, yeah, if it's in Van Buren, so tell how does that how does that work? So you, you just go check it out. I I don't know the details of how they're doing it, but typically uh, you get to check it out for ten to ten days to two weeks. Uh, okay. And, uh, well, when I looked on the list, the nearest one was Fayetteville. Well, we just we just delivered those, and they haven't been uh, they haven't made it on the map yet. Okay. But they're there. That is yeah, and they great and they name. should be lending them out. Yeah. Okay. But if you buy one, let me let me just say this: the the be best one to start out with is a Dobsonian, uh, which is what the library has which is what the library has is, is a, similar to a Dobsonian. If you buy one, one of my favorite YouTube guys is Ed Ting. And he says the, the first scope that, that, that even really, even people that have big scopes will have is like an eight inch Dobsonian um, because they're lightweight and they can get out and observe with them real quick. So that, that's a good telescope to buy. Now the ones that are in the libraries are four and a half inch and they're really good telescopes. Um, you can see a lot with them. They've got a zoom eyepiece on, on them. Uh, so you're not changing out eyepieces. Uh, and they go up to about what, 70 power or something like that. You can see the what rings. What was the name of the person on YouTube? Uh, Ed Ting. How do you spell that last name? T-I-N-G. Thank you. Got it. I think, uh, Mary, Tom, that uh, I think the Hot Springs Library has one too. Yeah, they've got th three. Ha has some. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we, we have a couple of spotting scopes, and Mary bought me a pair of 20 by 80 binoculars and a tripod. 
Too. Oh boy. Yeah, you can't hold them up. You can't. They're so heavy you can see your heartbeat, you know, because it's moving on. <laughs> yeah. But you got to have a pretty good tripod too, because when the wind blows or a car goes by or something, the ground shakes and you can see the quiver in the view. So. Uh huh. Yeah. You know, um. I'm real, you know, I've, I've got seven by fifties, 10 by fifties, seven by 35s. And I, my favorite ones are the eight by 42s. Those are my great go-tos. Yeah. These, our favorite ones are these. And I, seven by my dad bought these. They're like a million years old, but that's the ones that we carry all the time because you can carry them in the car and you don't have to set up or anything. Yeah. What are they? Seven by 35 or seven by 50? They're seven by 35. Okay. My daddy brought home a pair of seven by thirty fives from World War II, and uh, they got lost. <laughs> I think a guy I loaned them out at Boy Scout camp one time. I took them to Boy Scout camp, loaned them to somebody, and they dropped them in the lake. <laughs> oh no! Oh. I had an, I've had, I've had a couple more pairs of seven by thirty five cents. My dad bought these sometime in the nineteen sixties, and we've used them <laughs> ever since then. So. A neighbor gave me some eight by fifties. Um, all I can say is that they're really heavy. <laughs> oh. I don't know if that's a good one or not, but anyway, they're good for me to start with. No, yeah. no, that'd be a nice, a nice pair of binoculars. Yeah. For yeah. astronomy. Those look like seven by fifties that Angie's got. Mm -hmm. These are ten by fifties. Ten by fifty. Okay. Yeah, those are good. I've got a pair of those I really like. And Rocky, I have, do you have a room for all this? <laughs> Most of it's in the garage. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, I sure enjoyed it. I did too. I did too. Thank you so much. I'm uh, really uh, want to thank CJ Burks for <laughs> Kathy Joe for putting it on Facebook, and then I was able to sign up. Y'all need to, everybody needs to try to think about making the festival in Gilbert in October. It ought to be fun. It'll be a two night, uh, Friday night, Saturday and Saturday night affair with uh, all kinds of things going on during the day too. I'm definitely interested. That sounds fun. Just Google Gilbert skyfest or something like that uh, uh, go to our website arkansas dark sky dark sky arkansas.org <laughs> okay we've got a page dedicated to it okay great all right kids Thanks thank, a lot. You. thank you is this thank our you. last meeting this is it this is it okay well thank you so much great. all right uh -huh. thank you bye-bye